They're the ones we tend to be using, you say? Absolutely. So the Mediterranean diet, of course, you know, is based on olive oil. And there's a reason. Olive oil is a monounsaturate. Turns out oleic acid is the primary uh, fat in olive oil. And oleic acid turns on the liver to improve its metabolism. It's uh, a uh, transcription factor called PPR alpha. Um, uh, Omega-3s are part of the anti-inflammatory cascade. All of these things are very good. On the other hand, you go down to omega-6s, and they're part of the pro-inflammatory cascade. And trans fats, well, that's the devil incarnate, because you can't digest those. That double bond that makes it a trans fat, that's the reason they put it in all of the baked goods, is because it increases shelf life, because the bacteria can't chew it up. Well, guess what? Neither can you. Why did researchers believe that leptin could be the magic bullet when it was discovered back in 1994? So I was at Rockefeller when that whole business went on. No leptin very well. Leptin is the hormone that goes from your fat cell to your brain and tells your brain, you know what? I've had enough. I don't need to eat so much. I can burn energy properly and I don't have to have thirds on, you know, that, uh, that birthday cake. But the fact of the matter is, leptin's not working. Because if leptin were working, you wouldn't want that thirds on that birthday cake and you'd be thin and you'd have more energy. So, something has blocked leptin signaling. Turns out, if you're blocking leptin signaling, giving more leptin isn't going to overcome that. And that's why leptin ended up being shelved. But there is such a thing as leptin deficiency, but also something called lep leptin resistance. Right. There are 14 people in the world with leptin deficiency. They're all in the UK or Turkey, and they're all uh, genetic, uh, they're genetically of, of consanguineous marriages. Uh, basically, leptin works for those 14 people, and it doesn't work for anybody else. And that's why you can't find it on the, uh, uh, you know, at, the, at the pharmacy. The rest of us have plenty of leptin, boatloads of leptin. The more fat you have, the more, higher your leptin is. But if it were working, you wouldn't be fat. So, so we're not taking problem. leptin pills. No, there's no leptin pill and there's no leptin shot. You write about the four foodstuffs that contribute to metabolic syndrome. Uh, they're all found in highly processed food. Uh, all are all naturally occurring. We, we mentioned trans fats. Well, trans fats are not naturally occurring. Trans fats are made in the lab. Uh, 1902, the patent for uh, hydrogenation of fats was issued. 1911, Crisco appeared. 1920, virtually every baked good in America already had them. Fleischmann's margarine, as you remember, or imperial margarine back in the 1960s, that was the heyday for trans fats. And we were always told that those were preferable to butter. Well, you know what? Uh, there's a lot of bad nutrition science out there. That's what it comes down to. Uh, there's a, the Food and Drug Administration lets a lot of things on the market without testing. The, Diet, uh, foods and food supplements and uh, uh, dietary supplements and food additives have a very low bar to clear, not like drugs and devices. Now, corn uh, gives us the fructose, also gives us uh, branch chain amino acids. Should we not eat corn? Let's put it this way. If we ate corn like the cows that were grazing in Iowa back in the 19. 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, ate corn, we would be fine. The problem, as Michael Pollan put in his book very nicely, is that's all we eat now. Some manifestation of it. It's not a little, it's a lot. Same thing with sugar. It's not a little, it's a lot. So a little this corn the on the cob at the barbecue is perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. It's The problem is what all that corn got turned into and how you're consuming all of that. Many people overeat as a reaction to stress, uh, and that would be a behavioral thing, wouldn't it? Are, are there biochemical reasons for eating more when, when you're feeling stressed? Absolutely, of course. <laughs> First of all, um, you know, it's not stress. It's response to stress that matters. You know, pilots are the ultimate stressed people. They're the ultimate multitaskers. They can I do more talk things. Show uh, well, it depends which talk show host, I think. Um, <laughs> But uh, pilots can do many, many things at once. But you can ultimately overstress a pilot, too. There's an area of your brain called the amygdala, which is your stress center. And there's another area of your brain called the hippocampus, which is your memory center. And it turns out that the hippocampus is very responsive 
to what the amygdala is going on, what's going on at the amygdala. And if it turns out that you are overstressed, your brain calls for more energy to try to keep those neurons from dying. And so what happens is you end up eating more, and it's usually more high-energy, dense foods. So that's where comfort food comes from. And the principal stress hormone is cortisol? Cortisol. And cortisol does double duty. It makes you hungry, specifically to try to preserve these brain cells, but it also drives that abdominal fat, that visceral fat, that fat around the organs that causes disease. So cortisol is a primary player in how come we get so sick. My guest is Robert H. Lustig. His book, Fat Chance, Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease, is published by Hudson Street Press. We'll continue our conversation after we take a little break. Stay with us. Later this month, we're launching another Food Friday series. We'll be talking about food and cooking with some of the city's leading chefs, plus farmers and experts from around the country. And we'll have plenty of recipes to share as well. But we also want to know what you'd like to hear. So tell us what you liked about Food Fridays this past spring and what you'd like us to discuss this fall. Share your thoughts now on our show page at WNYC.org. This is WNYC, WNYC WNYC.org. You can also catch up with the show on both Facebook and Twitter. WNYC support comes from the Q4 School in Queens, inspiring students to achieve since 1918. Open house for all grades, nursery through 12th, on Thursday, September 25th at 5 p.m. Information online at kewforest.org. Emirates, offering daily nonstop service from JFK to Milan starting October 1st. More at emirates.com slash USA. Emirates, hello tomorrow. WNYC 93.9 FM, AM 820, and WNYC.org. And now, another WNYC sustaining member haiku, as read by Brooke Gladstone. Support NYC for stimulation mental in my cubicle. Lynn Cantor, New York, New York. Become a sustaining member today. Go to WNYC.org and click on support or call 1-888-376-WNYC. We're back with my interview of Dr. Robert Lustig from last March. His book, Fat Chance, Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease is published by Hudson Street Press. I asked him, why do you say that focusing on weight loss is not the right way to approach improving your health? Ultimately, it's not about the the weight. It's not about the fat. It's about the fat around your organs. When you stand on a scale, what are you measuring? You're measuring four things at once. Muscle, more is better. Bone, more is better. Subcutaneous fat, love handle fat, if you will. The, the butt fat, big butt fat, if you will. More is better. Now, more is better. That's more because is better. we want it reserved for the, the days, the lean days. Not just that, but in fact, um, <laughs> little old ladies who are missing that subcutaneous fat, much greater chance of breaking hips and dying. So, in fact, there's... Plenty of data that shows that a little overweight, like BMI 25 to 30, actually improves longevity. So sub-Q fat has never been shown to be problematic in terms of metabolic disease. So more is better. Last, visceral fat. That's the bad one. More is worse. And that's 4 to 6% of your total body fat. So when you stand on a scale, what are you measuring? So when I read in the Science Times that being a slightly overweight might actually be good for my health. Depends uh, where the overweight is. Mm-hmm. And it depends on what race you are. For instance, if you're slightly overweight and you're Indian or you're Asian, uh, you know, uh, Chinese or Japanese, might be a problem. If you're slightly overweight and you're African American, you're probably in better shape than the rest of uh, America. Now, a body is constantly uh, trying to find some equilibrium between storing fat and burning fat. So the, the real trick is to get the body to burn the fat that we don't need? Exactly. We need to burn the visceral fat. And what is the well, how do you do that? The body, does the body know the difference between the, the, the good fat and the bad fat? It absolutely does. It does. And the way you get rid of that visceral fat, we said it before, exercise. 
The, that is the metabolically active fat. That's the fat that goes first in response to exercise. Exercise does not cause weight loss. Why? Because exercise causes muscle gain. But what it does do is it removes, reduces that visceral fat, and that visceral fat is what's causing the disease. Why do you blame sugars totally? Uh, don't we also consume more carbohydrates these days? Right. So they're both an issue. I'm not suggesting that refined carbohydrate is not an issue. It is. Bread, rice, pasta, potatoes. Now, first of all, there's a lot of sugar in bread. But you know, let's talk about rice, pasta, potatoes. That is glucose. Now, glucose makes insulin go up because the pancreas releases insulin in response to a glucose rise. So, if you are a carboholic, and most obese people are carboholics, that is definitely going to make you release more insulin, and that will def definitely cause more fat deposition. That's not what we're talking about well, here. Well, uh, just can I stop you for a second? Why do diabetics take insulin if insulin is causing a problem? Insulin is both good and bad all at the same time. Now, the American Diabetes Association does not want you to know this. They want you to think that insulin is good because diabetics need to take insulin. And I agree, diabetics do need to take insulin. But here's the problem. There are two different pathways in the liver for insulin action. One lowers blood sugar. That's good. That's the metabolic side of insulin. But there's another pathway, which is the cell proliferation pathway. That's the cancer pathway. That's the increased muscle around your arteries pathway that promotes cardiovascular disease. So when you take a shot of insulin, you're doing short-term gain for long-term pain. It's good and bad all at the same time. The goal is to get your insulin down as much as you can and still do the job. Now, you say that sugar is the most successful food additive known to man, and it is the, the, the major problem here. Mm -hmm. But um, could we say that lifestyle is also a problem? Because uh, many people have noticed that people who live in walking cities, for example, mm -hmm. are less likely to be obese sure. than people who live in cities where you drive all the time. Sure, absolutely. New York, San Diego, absolutely. Correct. There's no question that increased expenditure improves lifespan. Um, the Taiwanese did a study that was in Lancet that showed 15 minutes of walking a day increases lifespan by three years. So there is no question that increasing activity is highly valuable and I am for it. And certainly America sits on its keister, um, you know, pretty much across the board. No argument. I am totally for exercise. Exercise is the antidote against this process because it builds muscle. So I'm not against that. I'm for that. The question is, how do you do that? How do you make people exercise? And then there's exercise and exercise, isn't there? Well, I mean, turns, should, should we just be on the treadmill and the elliptical? Turns out um, uh, there's uh, a cardio aerobic exercise and resistance training exercise uh, do about the same in terms of uh, metabolic health. So if you want to lift weights, if you want to play basketball, if you want to um, you know, be on the trainer, uh, if you just want to go for a run with your dog, you know, all of these things are valuable. And that is the best investment in all of medicine. 15 minutes a day for three years is 273 hours. To, get, to invest 273 hours for three years of longevity, that's a 6,400% return on investment. You know what? Wall Street would take that. Can we just walk a lot? Sure, absolutely, but you got to walk a lot. My guest is Robert H. Lustig. His book, Fat Chance, Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease. Why has the, the food industry turned to sugar over and over again as a way to improve taste? <laughs> How do they defend that decision? Well, okay, so there are two issues. The first is we went low fat as a country back in 1980. The McGovern Commission, basically, uh, 1977, identified dietary fat as the cause of heart disease inappropriately based on very bad science. There was a huge split in the medical community, but the McGovern Commission felt like they needed to do something. This was what they came out with, and basically the whole country went low fat back in 1980. We're blaming George McGovern for that? Uh, well, it was, his, it was his committee, anyway. Uh, the food industry knew, well, if you take the fat out of the food, the food tastes like cardboard. They had to do something to make the food palatable, so they started adding the sugar. And when they did, they realized, hey, you know what? 
people are buying more. Snack wells, perfect example. Two grams of fat out, 13 grams of carbohydrate up, four of which were sugar. And they're flying off the shelves. Hey, let's add a little bit more. And let's add a little bit more. Well, the fact of the matter is, of the 600,000 food items currently available in the American grocery store, 80% are now spiked with added sugar. And that's not just for flavor. That's because the food industry knows when they do, you buy more. That go, uh, sugar is addictive? Well, it is certainly abused. In animals, we have proven that it is addictive. In humans, we only have correlative studies at this point. We don't have mechanistic studies because you can't take people's brains out and grind them up and, you know, and look at them under the microscope. You know, the IRB frowns on that. So we only have correlative studies, but all the data goes in the same direction. Well, why does an eating sugar, especially fructose, trigger an insulin response? Well, first of all, remember, sugar is glucose and fructose. The glucose does trigger an insulin response. The fructose does not trigger an insulin response, and that's actually part of the problem. Because if it triggered an insulin response, your brain would get a signal. But because it doesn't, because it turns into liver fat, because it doesn't drive leptin immediately, your brain doesn't know you ate it. So you eat more because you didn't get the signal that you actually ate something. A couple of listeners have called in to ask, does the body metabolize alcohol as sugar? Well, the body metabolizes sugar like alcohol, that's for sure. Um, I've but let's say you drink, you drink wine or you drink uh, right. beer or right. whiskey. Uh, beer is a better uh, argument uh, for soda because beer is alcohol and glucose. Uh, soda is fructose and glucose, and the alcohol and the fructose are basically uh, interchangeable. Wine is just alcohol, but alcohol and fructose are metabolized in the liver basically the same way, through the same mechanisms. Um, no insulin regulation goes straight to the liver mitochondria and no glycogen pop-off. These are the three uh, uh, criteria that basically drive metabolic disease. And we know that beer is associated with metabolic syndrome, and shochu, the Japanese carbohydrate alcoholic beverage, also is. So we should cut down on the beer consumption? Uh, yeah, actually we should. Orla in Manhattan asks, how is it that people can be thin and diabetic given the dynamic that Dr. Lustig described, whereby uh, excess insulin leads to fat and weight gain? Well, because insulin resistance doesn't necessarily have to result in fat or weight gain. The point is insulin resistance is its own phenomenon, and thin people can do it too. And where does fiber fit into this story? Okay, so fiber is the stealth nutrient. Fiber, people don't even consider a nutrient. Fiber ends up in the garbage can. You know, when you turn uh, oranges into orange juice, the fiber ends up in the garbage can. The fact is that the fiber is the best part of the orange, and it's what's ending up in the garbage and, can. And sometimes when I go to the supermarket, I can't... All, all of the orange juice that's available is, says no pulp. Right. Well, I'm looking for the heavy pulp. Well, stuff. to be honest with you, once it's juiced, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that the fiber acts as a barrier on the inside of the intestine. And what that does is it limits how fast your liver gets that onslaught of sugar that you just consumed with that juice. And by doing so, your liver has a chance to catch up and metabolize it before it turns into liver fat. So fiber actually is uh, very beneficial, and we are way down in terms of fiber consumption. We're supposed to be consuming somewhere between 50 and 100 grams. The USDA says we should be consuming 25 grams, and our median consumption right now is 12 grams. And where would we get the fiber? Real food. I mean, well, eating fruit, for example. Fruit, fruit vegetables. I mean, there's fiber in... Fiber fruit, cereals? Legumes. There's all, you know, uh, uh, if it's brown or if it's green, it's fiber. The point is, we don't eat those things. Now we eat white. That's basically what we've done, is we've refined it. And there's a reason we've refined it, shelf life, because fiber doesn't freeze very well. Somebody also uh, argued that when we first started doing white somewhere in the mid-20th century, it was, there was a, almost a racist aspect to it. White just seemed preferable. Well, <laughs> that may have had something to do with it, I won't argue. You go through some of the more popular diets, including a low-fat diet, the Atkins diet, a vegetarian and vegan diet, the Mediterranean diet, the Paleolithic diet. Are they all, do they all have positives and negatives? Leonard? You know, there are a zillion diets. There's the Twinkie diet. I mean, you know, there's so many diets out there. And the fact is they all work except they don't. That's what it comes down to. Everybody who goes on a diet, it works for two months, and then every diet regresses to the mean. 
That's what Christopher Gardner and the Stanford A to Z study showed. It doesn't matter what diet you're on. By the end of two months, you're on the same diet, and it's called the Western diet. And that's because of availability. That's what we do. Every one of these diets works for different reasons, but they all have two things in common. Low sugar, high fiber. Every diet that works is low sugar, high fiber, and that's got a name. A low sugar, high fiber diet is called real food. That's what I'm proposing. It's called real food. Which Michael Pollan's also proposing. Absolutely. Yeah. Michael and I agree completely. He's talking about the socio-ecological aspects of food. I'm talking about the biochemical aspects. But ultimately, it's the same issue. But I will say that the biochemical aspects are the ones that could potentially change policy. Well, let's talk about policy, because many people have complained that um, farm policy uh, supports uh, the, the growing of the less healthy foods and... Uh, and, does, and, and organic farmers uh, are not being helped. Small farmers are not being helped. Right. Uh, when we had, when May, Mayor Bloomberg uh, tried to cut back on the size of sodas, uh, he was hit by a very heavy PR campaign. You bet. And, and people have called him stupid and oh, okay. ridiculous about that. No, listen, uh, Mayor Bloomberg is doing the right thing. Absolutely. And he has the p power to do this. This is within the authority of the Department of Health. It's called police power. Um, it, it's why you don't have uh, smoking in restaurants. It's why trans fats have disappeared from uh, uh, restaurants and menus, because he has the power to do this. Uh, I read the opinion of uh, Judge Tingland uh, regarding what's going on. He referred to a specific case called Boreali v. Axelrod, which occurred back in the 1980s, and it had to do with smoking in public places. This is a very different case, and ultimately we'll be able to, uh, I'm sure Mayor Bloomberg will be able to marshal the forces to get that appealed. The point is, the point is nobody needs a 16-ounce soft drink. Now we have less than a minute, but uh, should the healthcare industry be getting more involved in all of this? The healthcare industry... Insurance companies? The in to be honest with you, the insurance company's been your enemy for all these years. The fact is, they're the only friend you have. And the reason is because they're losing money on this too. They want this fixed, and they're the only ones powerful enough to bring the uh, issue to the food industry straight up. Robert H. Lustig's book, Fat Chance, Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease. It's published by Hudson Street Press. And Dr. Lustig, it's been a great pleasure talking with you oh, today. Oh, my pleasure, Glenn. Thank you for having me. On tomorrow's show, Ray Suarez talks about the role Latinos have played in shaping the nation for over 500 years. And then Lee Childs on Never Go Back, his latest Jack Reacher novel. Robert Sullivan shines a light on the often overlooked roles of New Jersey and New York in the American Revolution and talks about his personal odyssey that involved camping in New Jersey backyards and traveling in a homemade boat. We will also learn about FBI surveillance, illegal break-ins, infiltration, planted news stories, and poison pen letters at Berkeley in the 1960s. The Leonard Lopez Show is produced by Blakey Schick, Jude Corcoran, and Jessica Miller. Melissa Egan is the executive producer. Debbie Daughtry was at the audio controls. And we had help today from Galen Druk and Wendy Blake. I'm Leonard Lopez, your host. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.